the first webinar in our new Automation Excellence webinar series, which is presented by Black Hills IP. Black Hills IP is an accurate, efficient, and cost-effective U.S.-based IP docketing and paralegal service provider. Black Hills IP focuses on using computerized processes and artificial intelligence approaches to provide more reliable and consistent service than is possible to be achieved by an individual human being alone. For this webinar series, we're focusing on automation in intellectual property administration, as well as in the legal field more generally. The webinar that we're starting off with today is focused specifically on the topic of the role of artificial intelligence in docketing your intellectual property matters. We've allowed time for questions at the end of this program. You can submit questions at any time during the program, though, using the question box on the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll hold the questions in the queue, and we'll take the questions at the end of the program. The presenters today are myself, Z. Carrion, Milena Higgins, and Leonie Mann. I'm Ann McCracken, the president of Black Hills IP. I'm a patent attorney with 21 years experience in patent prosecution. I was a partner in the Schwegman firm for many years, and I was also a full-time law professor and directed the patent prosecution program at Franklin Pierce Law Center for five years. The program that we are presenting today was originally presented by Z and Milena as part of the Global IP Conference that was held in Minneapolis last month. They've agreed to present this program again today. They also have with them Leone Mann. Although Leone Mann is not one of the primary presenters, she is our um, automation expert and it will be available for questions at the end of the program if there's questions that apply to her. Um, the, the program is going to be in the form of a case study that is based on a collaboration between Black Hills IP and the law firm Schwegman Lundberg Wissner. And as I said, Milena and Z will be presenting the, the results of this. So Z, can you give an introduction of yourself? Yeah, um, good afternoon everyone. My name is Shakalaski Karian. I am the docketing manager at Schwegman Lundberg and Wissner. I went to uh, law school in Mexico and passed my bar exam there in 2004. And shortly after that, in 2005, I moved to Minneapolis and started working at SLW. Uh, I've been part of the SLW team for 13 years, of which eight years. I've been part of the docketing department, and I think I'm here to say I found my calling in docketing. Milena. Thanks. Um, Thanks, Steve. Go ahead, Melina. Hello, everybody. I'm Melina Higgins. I'm the Chief Operating Officer and Director of AI at Black Hills IP. Um, I started my career as a physicist, and then shortly after grad school, patent law found me. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of stumbled into this field and have loved it ever since. So I worked in litigation initially, um, took the patent bar along the way, then got interested in management. And um, after the economy tanked 10 years ago, I went back uh, and got a business degree in management of technology. That kind of led to my love of process improvement and, and all, this, all the changes that we're seeing in our industry. Um, I started consulting with Black Hills IP last summer and then came on board full time in the fall as director of AI. Um, and today I'm um, running operations for the company as well. So it's an exciting time to be here. Let me just give you an overview of the presentation. In the next hour, we will do a, a brief crash course on AI just to kind of set the groundwork for the rest of the uh, discussion. Then we'll go into the project timeline for our collaboration together. We'll talk about the issues and the challenges we faced along the way. Then we'll show you a, a video that kind of summarizes our solution. We'll go over benefits of the work we've done and then we'll end the presentation with some real life examples of AI data. So let us get started. 
We all know that when it comes to high volume prosecution, the importance of having a quality patent docketing system is, is very high. Artificial intelligence is in the news more frequently than ever today. We've all seen it, we've all heard it. Um, some of us are sometimes tired of it because it's <laughs> overhyped. But nonetheless, it's, get, it's gaining momentum in the legal industry. And so that is why we're here today. We're here to talk to you about our collaboration together between Black Hills IP and the Schwegman Lundberg firm. Um, and as Ann said, this will be presented as a case study on the evolution of IP docketing via artificial intelligence and automation. So I'll turn it over to Z to tell so, us about the beginnings. Well, we can all remember a time uh, when companies were outsourcing work to other countries. And well, SLW was any, it wasn't any different. And in our case, we outsourced to India. And initially this was a good idea. It was a good solution. But over time, we also saw quality issues arose. And yes, labor was cheap, but when you factored in having to fix the quality, uh, the total cost was not any less expensive. So this pushed us to look for other solutions. And um, this is when we decided to bring the work back to the US. And this is where artificial intelligence starts to, uh, the idea of artificial intelligence starts to um, get into some of our peers' heads. And uh, that's what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, we will tell you about our journey. And in this journey, like Melina and Anne already mentioned, uh, in our collaboration, Schwegman is going to be the client and BHIP is going to be the vendor. Great. Um, I just want to say a couple of words about this image that we're looking at. This, this picture of a bridge was selected because it kind of represents our journey from one place to another. We had this vision of a future, uh, this beautiful island, tropical, warm, sunny. <laughs> um, and then there's a road to get there. And sometimes the road was uh, easy, sometimes not so much. Sometimes there were potholes and, and roadblocks, and sometimes it was smooth going. Um, some days you saw beautiful sailboats floating by, other days you saw sharks in the water. So <laughs> um, that's a little foreshadow of what's to come. Um, before we get into the case study itself, I'd like us to have a quick overview of art, what artificial intelligence is kind of in context of what we'll talk about today. Artificial intelligence is one of these fields that if you, add, if you ask 10 AI experts to define it, you might get 10 different answers. So what we're looking at in this slide is, is just one of those ways of looking at AI. You can divide the field into these four quadrants where you either know the question or you don't know the question and you know the answer or you don't know the answer. And to kind of go over them briefly, if you know the question and you know the answer, you're talking about a rules engine. A rules engine is a system where the rules are explicitly provided and the computer uses those rules to make deductions and choices, uh, for example, as in an expert system. In essence, it just emulates decision making of a human expert. Moving down the, to the lower quadrant, if you know the question but you don't know the answer, you're in the realm of machine learning. Machine learning uses statistical techniques to allow a computer system to learn without being explicitly programmed. It essentially, you feed it a whole bunch of data and based on that data and statistical analysis and other techniques, the system learns how to interpret the data. An example of machine learning is used in, in e-discovery. If any of you have been involved in litigation at all, you've probably used machine learning in, in e-discovery with technology-assisted review. Moving to the next quadrant, when you don't know the answer and you don't know the question, you're in the world of deep learning. This is, this is the work that companies like Google are, are doing, are, are deep into. This is a class of machine learning, uh, but you're using multiple layers of nonlinear processing. And an example that you may have heard of is uh, neural networks. It's essentially a system that simulates how a human brain works. It's learning by example. 
And then lastly, if you don't know the question, but you know the answer, we're talking about Jeopardy. And we all know that AI tackled that as well. In 2012, <laughs> IBM Watson won the game of Jeopardy. We've, we've probably all seen that in the news. So today, the work that we will be talking about primarily focuses on the upper left quadrant. We're talking about the rules engine type of AI because of the work that we're in. We're in docketing where the, the answers need to be very precise. So let's look at the timeline of our collaboration. Um, as Z mentioned, back in 2011, we had this quality problem that we were wanting to solve. We wanted to bring the work back to the US um, from being outsourced in, to India. And we also wanted to add a layer of automation. We wanted to automate things that are routinely done by people just to eliminate some of the, the errors that we were seeing. And so that's when the idea of our company, Black Hills IP, was born. In 2012, we did the work to lay the technology foundation for what was to come. We created the first technology layer and we started scraping documents from the USPTO. The following year in 2013, the idea of automation was communicated and that's when we really started to build everything on top of it. The next three to four years we spent um, building the technology and that included things like changing our internal processes both at Black Hills IP and at Schwegman and this is when we collaborated um, quite heavily we changed the way people dock it essentially we we did all that to get ready for automation because that was the end goal Along the way, we developed something that today we refer to as machine-guided docketing, and you'll get a glimpse of that a little later in the presentation. Um, we, the, the journey started with manual docketing, but then along the, along the way, we built proprietary software that now enables people to be guided through that docketing process. Um, and so all this time we're spending building the layers and the changing the processes and kind of putting the pieces of the puzzle in place to make things happen. In July of 2017, this is right around the time that I joined Black Hills IP, we auto docketed our first item. And what that means is from the moment a document is scraped from the USPTO, to the moment that item is docketed in Schwegman's FIP system, no human touched it. It was all completely done by computer. By March of 2018, when we were pulling the data together for this presentation, 61% of all USPTO documents that we process for Schwegman were docketed automatically in that same way, no human hands touching it. And of course, we see the future as heading towards fully automated docketing someday. So I will turn it over to Z to talk about kind of how, what the issues were and how, how we tackle them. Well, so as, as we had mentioned previously, um, there were issues to resolve and we will talk about those in this slide and the first steps taken to create our artificial intelligence. And as we can see in the issues to resolve is difficult to interpret foreign documents. And what happens here is you work with different kinds of foreign associates for different countries. And uh, you will notice sometimes some foreign associates call one type of document different ways and referring to the exact same document. Uh, one clear example comes up to my head right now is a notice of acceptance versus a notice of allowance. Well, um, in some countries, it, it, it is notice of allowance and it's okay. You call me notice of acceptance. I totally know that you're talking about a notice of allowance, but in other countries, notice of acceptance means something else. So that 
that creates a little confusion. Um, another thing that we've seen is what the patent office calls it versus the foreign associate. Another clear example is the Korean patent office. Kippo will call the first office action notification of reasons for refusal or uh, yeah, for refusal. And um, the foreign associate will just call it first office action. And then another one, Kippo will call um, decision of refusal, the final office action. And again, the foreign associate will call, here's the final office action. But then there are other foreign associates that will call it exactly what it is. They just don't call it the same all the time. So um, another thing too would be having little control of, uh, of the system that you're working in. And um, Schwegman works with Foundation IP. And there's one template code that comes up to my mind right now is the foreign counterpart activity, the FFIL activity, that might work perfect for other clients, but for our needs, it's not quite there. But if I would create another template code, then it would just be duplicates out there and it would just create chaos. So since we don't really have control over our system, sometimes you just have to work around it, but it's definitely little issues that you need to work with, you know? Um, so there's that and human error. Who hasn't made uh, an error before? And you say, well, I'm only human, you know? So uh, the computer can't say that, right? Um, artificial intelligence will have to figure out, um, like in uh, something that comes up with the human error that a lot of people can make these mistakes is uh, dates that are crucial for docketing because you screw up a date and you uh, that means that you made you docketed something incorrectly. Mm -hmm. So in the US, we have month, day and year. And for our neighbors and European countries, they use date, month and year. So um, yes, it's it's an human error, but that's why you're trying to figure out what would catch these. So what are the first, because of all of these things that I mentioned, um, this and other issues, there was a need for us to create artificial intelligence according to our needs, you know, what we wanted in the system that we're working in. And so our first steps that we took was we had to analyze the data and recognize the patterns. So as you can all see, there's a document right in front of you in the middle of this slide that's in Chinese. And you could say, well, I don't know Chinese, you know, uh, I don't either. I just know English and Spanish. But you know what we did, we recognized some patterns. I can tell you that the document that's in front of you is an office action. I can tell you that it was mailed on November 16, 2017. And that's because with experience, with um, a whole bunch of times receiving these type of documents, you get to know um, this is an office action. This is this form and this is what it does and this is what you need to dock it. And um, another clear example of this, who hasn't received a search report and written opinion that is in Russian? And you'd be like, I don't know Russian. But um, you see the pattern, you see that it is a search report and written opinion. You, With the date mailed, you'll be able to docket your demand Article 34 amendment and your Article 19 amendment due dates. So um, what happens once you recognize these patterns and you analyze that data that you have received, you start creating your procedures and your checklists and creating templates in your system that will work exactly how you want. And you definitely need to do uh, research in the country law because if you're just creating all these templates, uh, you have to be responsible enough to be looking at the country law as well, since it's constantly changing on their end too. So in the next slide, um, we will talk about the client and vendor challenges. On my end, the Schwegman end, um, as a client, you need to expect constant change. And... Um, I have an example regarding this that didn't happen so long ago was the notice of allowance. 
In December, we started docketing with uh, corrected drawings and other activities docketed by default too. And um, and at that time, our idea was if it's not needed, then just go ahead and clear it. Um, this way, nothing gets missed. But uh, we, we change our checklist, we change some procedures, and then all of a sudden in January, we figure out how the artificial intelligence is going to be able to think if drawings are needed or not. Um, and if it's not, then it won't automatic, it, it won't just dock it by default, you know, the, the, the activity. So what happens in January, one month had just gone by and there was already a change, but a change to the positive, you know? So, uh, but people don't like this change. So I got a lot of emails in between of, I was never aware of this and now this is changing or why is this getting docketed? And um, also with that, it comes out with people are not happy with this change. They're afraid of automation. And I will tell you five years ago, I was in the same boat. I was like, uh, they were telling me that this program was gonna dock it automatically, some documents. And I was like, uh, yeah, right. And look at now, we are doing this presentation about artificial intelligence and how it's uh, helping us. But I have noticed between all this constant change with the process and the people, the key here is communication between the client, the vendor, and the people that you're working with. Absolutely. So that that's a great segue into the vendor challenges. Um, we run into very similar similar problems in the sense that you know when we are talking to our docketers and we want them to change uh, the way that they do something, we the the thing you often hear back is but we've always done it this way, and so there's resistance. People don't like change, just like you said, Z. Um, you have to communicate the reason for the change, and that typically will help get over the hump that if, if you can show people why you're doing what you're doing and, and show them that beautiful island at the end, um, they will often get on board and, and go along with you on this journey. The other thing on my list on, of vendor challenges, technology bumps in the road. I mentioned this earlier when we were looking at that beautiful picture of the bridge and the island. Um, no matter what technology you're working on, no matter how much you've tested it, you're going to run into, into bumps. You're going to run into issues that you hadn't anticipated. Uh, that's just the way technology rolls. You're just going to have to be prepared for that and know that it will come no matter how well prepared you think you are. Um, it just happens. And then the last item on my list is lack of control of third-party systems. And Z already mentioned this, when you're working with a docketing system, you don't have control over the way that it works. You may be able to customize certain things, but there may be other things that you need it to do that it doesn't do. And so you need to find ways to work around that to make it behave and do things so that you can do what you wanna do on your side. So that is a, a challenge. And again, communication there is key because there may be, you may be working in a docketing system that doesn't have some feature, but if you're communicating with that vendor, maybe it's on their technology roadmap and maybe they're just about to roll it out and you won't know that until you talk to them. Um, one last thing I want to bring up before we go to the next slide is, um, this is an example of, of people and people that we as a vendor hire today versus let's say two years ago. Um, we obviously value docketing experience. So everyone we hire for our docketing department, we value their experience with docketing. And that is still true today. But in addition to that, when I interview people today for docketing, I also ask questions that get at their adaptability, their curiosity, their ability to be open to try new things and not always do things the same way. So <laughs> yeah. that becomes very important in, in kind of the, the people that you bring on board um, on your team. 
So this whole experience is going to be or has been a combination of changes of the process, of the people, of the technology, and all three of them are intertwined and need to work together. Um, oftentimes when technical people are working with the technology, they favor that part. And um, you may not always think about how the technology affects the process or the people. And just like what we mentioned in the last slide, um, it's very important to keep all three in mind and preferably in balance, but also um, communication is key here. Because if these three uh, parts are not communicating with each other, then something cannot fall off your radar or there's just, we need that balance. Um, it's kind of, it, it's very important to have it in balance and it's also kind of like a recipe for a cake that you just throw a little bit of the process, a little bit of the people and the technology, then you just like mix it up until it's all like, um, until it's smooth and all the lumps have been gone away, you know? So um, it's always key to keep all three in mind and for that communication to exist between them. Um, so after this, uh, let's let's see a short summary video that explains how we applied the artificial intelligence to solve the quality and those uh, productivity problems that we were having. So in the video that you're going to see next, uh, you'll see how we developed a way to use that artificial intelligence in docketing. The docketing field is going through a huge shift today. In the past, a successful docketing team relied on training the right people to perform meticulous tasks with pinpoint precision. Since a law degree is typically not required, firms and corporations would invest a lot of time and resources into training and development. To minimize potential mistakes, they were often well versed in the laws and regulations surrounding the patent prosecution process. If the docking specialist had any questions, a big book of rules and procedures sat on their desk for reference. Let's get a quick show of hands from anyone in the crowd who remembers this. Yeah, let's not go back to that. That's because this book constantly needed updating as regulations around the world are always changing. I'm feeling tired just thinking about this. Now there's an obvious downside to relying on people to perform meticulous tasks, and I guarantee anyone in this room can relate. We all make mistakes. That's why, while people are still paramount to a modern docketing department, they are supported by smart technology. Machine-guided docketing helps create a quicker and far more accurate docketing experience for the user, and in turn, the client. Put in simple terms, you can teach AI to operate within the strict guidelines of patent law and then automate the monotonous work. For example, let's say you received an office action. Technology can now identify the document, locate the important information, and add any crucial dates to the docket. The system then runs an extensive audit on any discrepancies and sends a detailed report to you, the user. The world of technology is moving fast, and the law field is no exception. Don't get stuck in the past. Great, so now you saw um, the solution to the, the problem that Z described initially and kind of what the world looks like today um, in docketing. Uh, the slide that we're looking at now is just a quick summary of what the video showed us. So the artificial intelligence we, we developed together can help us identify the document when we scrape something from the US Patent Office the the system can identify what we're looking at whether that's a power of attorney document or an office action or something else the artificial intelligence can also help us identify the pertinent parts of that document and that is where we get to the machine guided docketing it can tell whether it's an office action um, what what is the information that it needs to get from that office action to dock it the next action that needs to happen. Um, and then the last step that the AI can do is run this audit that the video just mentioned. It will compare what actually ended up in the customer system to what we put into it in the beginning so that to make sure that there are no discrepancies to verify that it was done as we expect. So let's talk about the benefits of this technology. 
Well, um, after seeing that video and um, laying a slide, let us tell you what that um, what the benefits are applying artificial intel intelligence for the clients and for the benef uh, for the vendor. And these are on, on the client side. I'm going to say, um, imagine a big arrow going up. And why do I say this? Because um, we've noticed that our speed goes up, um, the productivity goes up, and the quality goes up. Why the speed? Why productivity and quality? Well, we're getting um, our documents within one day rather than three days. Before, that was our goal, and that was great. It, it was a good goal. Within three days of receiving something from the patent office, we would uh, report it out to the client, or it needed to be in our system. And now, within the same day, we are getting it into our system. That means that uh, we're getting documents sooner rather than later, and we're getting um, report outs to our client of what is being received um, sooner too. The good thing of all this stuff, that the cost doesn't have, it's not going up. It's just steady, it's just straight. It's not going up or it's not going down. Um, but this is really beneficial because you are getting your documents um, fast. Uh, there's less quality issues because artificial intelligence is not making the same errors as human errors. And uh, whenever there are little mistakes then you and you find it and identify it, then you can just fix it. It's not going to happen again, you know. And all of this just has happy clients. And for us, this is a great benefit, you know. We all want to have our clients That's happy. Right. We all like happy clients. Mm -hmm. And the vendor benefits are very similar, as you can see from the slide. Our speed goes up, our productivity goes up. We can do a whole lot more with a computer helping us than you can with people alone. Um, we can process a, a lot more documents, and we'll see a little bit of data on that in a few minutes. Um, our quality also goes up because you eliminate those human errors. And then I put lower costs when we were preparing this because going forward, we can do more with less, meaning we can process more documents without having to hire the same amount of people that we might have had to without this technology. Um, so the caveat there is that we did put in quite a, an investment up front to get to this point, but going forward, the costs are lower. Uh, and that enables us as the vendor to stay competitive on price and offer higher quality to our customers. Um, and then that results in happy clients, yep. like Schwedman and Lundberg. <laughs> <laughs> Super happy. Exactly. <laughs> so let's look at some real life data on what the world looks like. This is a slide that shows the world before automation. This is a year ago in 2017. I picked um, eight of the most common documents that we process for the Schwegman firm um, on the US side. Um, and you can see relatively how many of those um, we process in relation to others on this list. I purposefully left out numbers, um, but generally the entirety of what we're looking at represents roughly 3,000 documents processed in uh, a span of a couple of months. So you can see that we process a whole lot more non-final rejections and powers of attorney than, for example, abandonments and notices of uh, missing parts. And so in 2017, all of these documents were being processed by humans, by, by our docketing staff. And in 2018, those same two months, the world looks quite different. The blue... Um, documents are being processed by our friendly robot Otto. Um, Otto is, is not processing absolutely everything. As you can see, there are still some gray parts to these bars. There are still documents for various reasons that need to be handled by humans, but a vast majority of these today are being processed automatically. Mm -hmm. 
Let's look at this data in a slightly different way. I was curious when I was preparing for this presentation, just how much quicker is Otto compared to a human docketer? So a person on average, if, if I took that data that we just looked at in the bar charts, a human docketer took 1.65 days to process a document on average. And Otto took 4.57 seconds. That is a huge <laughs> difference. How much faster is Otto? That represents um, an increase. It's it's thirty thousand times faster. It's oh, I can't wow. even wrap my yeah. head around it yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a lot faster. So there's a lot of potential here. Um, I have another slide that kind of um, shows this yet another way. I mentioned in the beginning that in March we were processing 61% of USPTO documents um, with this artificial intelligence technology for Schwegman. If you look at all documents processed, so, so uh, both US and foreign, we are looking at 33%. So it's still a huge number that a fully a third of your documents are being handled by auto today. Wow. Um, and then just because I'm a data geek, I, I wanted <laughs> to look at the numbers yet a different way. Um, I compared just how many more documents auto can process compared to a person. So the if I just organize it by who processes the most documents and I compare auto to the next best person on my list, um, auto can process two and a half times the volume um, of all documents, and if I looked at just U.S. document, it's four times as much. And obviously, that's just a, a tiny scratch in the surface because yeah. there's potential there to do 30,000 times more based on the speed alone. Wow. Um, so it's a huge, huge um, opportunity to continue going down this road to automation and, and just keep doing more so that we can automate more documents and, and keep going down this path. Well, you know, just doing this presentation, um, I was, I knew what we were doing and what we were working on, mm -hmm. but I was just wowed with all that, um, what the artificial intelligence has done and all that data gathered for this. And um, what's cool about this is that we're just talking about docketing right now. And this infrastructure can just go to the case management or the paralegals. Um, this technology can be just reused, applied to a similar but different process with a whole new group of people. So it's kind of like this octopus, you know? <laughs> I don't know. It um, is. You mean autopus. <laughs> autopus, yeah, yeah, that's actually a great name. <laughs> So, yeah, no, it's very true. We built this technology. Uh, we focused on docketing to begin with, but we built this technology in layers, kind of like I alluded to in the beginning. So there are definitely layers of this technology that can be repurposed for our paralegal work or our renewals team or analytics or whatever other service um, we can think of and and we're we're going down that path. we don't mm -hmm. we don't have the results to show like we do today with docketing and, and the project with Schwegman, but we are definitely heading in that direction. Well, let us wrap this up. Um, let me recap quickly. We, uh, we started the day or the hour with an overview of our case study and I did a quick crash course on AI. We then showed you the project timeline of our collaboration together. Uh, Z and I talked about the issues and the challenges. You then saw a brief video on our solution. We talked about the benefits of using artificial intelligence in, in IP. And then we showed you some real life automation data. So Z, what are the lessons learned here? Well, I think that we all need to apply a little Elsa from uh, Frozen to the artificial intelligence. Just let it go. Don't get stuck in the past. <laughs> But I think, yeah, I agree with that. If you have any apprehensions and you want to try it, uh, my my advice, I, I take it from Nike, just do it. <laughs> take a take a small project and try it. It's uh, it's it's challenging, but it's fun and it's very rewarding and and it can move your business forward. Mm -hmm. I like that. We have. Um, for those of you attending today, if you want a demo uh, of your department, uh, 
if you'd like to get started in a, a more in-depth discussion about how our technology can help your organization, type I want one into the chat and you'll get a, we can schedule a personal demo for you and your team. Um, and if you request a demo before the end of the webinar, we will send you one of our custom Black Hills IP bobbleheads. Woo, <laughs> I want one. <laughs> All right, thank you, Z and Melena. That was great. I want to now remind the audience that questions for today's program can be submitted with the question in the question box on the control panel on your screen. We do have a few questions in the queue, and there's still time if you have a question that you would like to add to the queue. Also, if you have questions generally about Black Hills IP services or processes, please contact our Vice President of Sales, Jim Brophy. His contact information is on the slide in front of you. So let's start with the questions that um, we have in the queue. Um, let me see. So here's the first one. Are multiple client-specific template codes available for the same action? And gals, I'm hearing a little bit of feedback. Um, so let me say that again. Are multiple client-specific template codes available for the same action? For example, could you have a template for a non-final office action for client A that would include filing due dates and then a different template for a non-final office action for client B that would include a date to send a reporting letter or a draft or something else. So I think it, to put this in context, um, Milena and Z and Leone, if we think about this as Schwegman and you have a non-final office action that comes in for Schwegman, could the auto docketing rules process that non-final office action, office action differently for one client for the Schwegman firm versus a different client for the Schwegman firm? And and the answer to that is yes. We we already do this for um, for our customers, where one customer might want a slightly different way of docketing something. So yes, our systems do accommodate that. Okay, uh, good. What happens when the PTO indexes a document incorrectly? For instance, if it's a non-final office action, but the PTO has indexed it as a final office action. Will the document be docketed as a final or as a non-final? Yeah, this is a really interesting question. We've we've run into this and we've noticed um, that that happens from time to time. We actually, the technology that we developed actually looks at the document itself in addition to looking at the the way that the patent office has indexed it. So we would catch the discrepancy between the two and we would docket it correctly. Um, I will say too, as the as a client, when we see this, we have asked Black Hills to docket it as a final office action, and when they're reporting it out to us to say that there was a discrepancy, because we don't want to mm -hmm. assume that's just an office a non-final office action. Um, you know how the final office actions you have the opportunity to file two months or three months, and then you have the notice of appeal and all that. So just to be on the safe side, we ask for it to be docketed as a final office action. Once it's reported out to us that there's some kind of discrepancy, we contact uh, the patent office, and, well, not the patent office, the examiner, um, just to make sure that we do have a non-final office action or a final office action in our hands because sometimes they make mistakes too. They're only human. So um, at that point, once there's confirmation from the examiner, we just turn around and say, hey, this should be a non-final office action. Can you redock it? And that's just the way that we, we um, work to resolve that issue. Great. Um, the next question is about docketing systems. Docketing systems like Foundation IP and others talk about their ability to auto docket pair correspondence. How does your auto differ from what's built into the docketing system itself? 
I'm going to turn that one to Leone. Leone, if you um, if you're on the line still, could you yes. speak to this one, please? A question. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead, Leone. Okay. Um, I was trying to understand and the question because um, how does auto differ from what's built into the docketing systems already? Um, can you guys clarify what 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 is being asked here? I I'm not quite sure, yeah, but actually maybe I can I can take this one. I know um, back when the uh, foundation IP was being developed and the Schwegman firm was closely involved. I, I know they were working on a technology to um, do one-click docketing, and I'm not sure how that's evolved in CPA Global's version of it, but I think there there are some limited processes, but they certainly don't have the capability to go to the level of granularity that the auto docketing process that the Black Hills IP organization has developed. So it might be that certain docketing systems depend on a document being named a certain way or a file being named a certain way and then that naming convention will trigger or launch a action or an activity in that system. I've seen some systems that have that. I've seen some systems where the docketing system will scrape the document or pull the document from pair and that system will do based on just the document code suggest what the document um, or what needs to be docketed but again we saw from the earlier question that somebody asked that even that has limitations because those are sometimes coded wrong so there's a lot more um, power in the system that um, Milena and Z have described than what I've at least seen in any of the commercial docketing systems that are out there today um, Leone, did you have anything to add to that, or does that cover it? No, that was perfectly stated. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh huh. Um, if you're using the PTO document codes to determine the type of document issued for automatic processing, how do you identify documents? I think we already. I think this is a repeat of one we already had. How do you identify documents that are improperly coded or labeled? Melina, I think you answered this already. But any further comments? Yeah, I mean, we just we look at the, at the document itself. Go ahead, Leone. And I'd like to also add that we do. That's a really good question. Um, we do verify on the front end and the back end when we're automating these documents to ensure that our rules work and that auto is reading the actual document and, and it's appropriate to the actual system that it's mapped to. And Leone, when you say front end and back end, I understand what you mean is on the front end, it's prior to docketing being put into a docketing right. system and the back end is after the docketing has actually been added to the docketing system, that verification process is confirming that what should have been added is what was actually added, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, again, there's a lot of questions around the document codes. For the auto docketing, you use the USPTO document codes or do you actually read the documents? And it's kind of a combination of both, right, guys? Yes. Yeah, and we we actually do read the documents. We have uh, we have technology that will literally go and look at the document and discern what it's looking at. But when you say that we read, it's the actual artificial intelligence doing it, not a person, and Correct. that's why it takes Correct. it's faster to do it. That's right. Okay. So you're using OCR technology to look at the content of the document as well as the document code that the PTO has associated with it, correct? That's right. Yeah, that's one part of it, yes. Okay. Um, using AI for faster, more efficient docketing is awesome. Thank you for that comment, Stacy. Does this tie into the paper light concept? I don't if I'm familiar with that. Are you guys familiar with that terminology? We may need clarification from Stacy on this one. Is it like paperless? What a lot of yeah. uh, company or law firms had gone to that now we're not 
doing actual paper files, but we're going paperless and it's all electronic. That's kind yeah, of how. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. okay. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Stacy, for clarifying. <laughs> Yes, that's uh, it does fit into that. I mean, it's basically we can process, we can scrape the document from the USPTO and and put it into Schwegman's FIP without that document ever getting printed and put on somebody's desk. Uh huh. Yeah. But does your AI work with different client base, databases such as Anaqua, LaCorpio, CPI? any number of those systems. Leone, you want to take this one? <laughs> yes. Uh, so yes, uh, this is the fun part of my job. I am, We are able to automate in Foundation IP, App Call, and semi-automate in CPI, very close to automating in CPI. And then we are entertaining um, some development within the LaCorpio system, IP Manager, and Aqua, and Number and let me add to that, Leone, the, uh, there's different levels of automation, I'd say, that could apply with any of these systems. And what you focused on particularly there is the ability to automate the manual data entry process. But even without the manual data entry process being automated, you can still get the benefit by having Black Hills IP use their AI rules engine to process the um, docketing before it's manually entered into the docketing system, correct? Even That's, if you don't have a direct integration or connection with that system. That's right. I can do the first part, which is choose the procedure, identify the document to the appropriate activity in the within that particular system. So I can already have that ready for the docketer. Mm -hmm. And that's really the most complex part of the process from a docketing standpoint, if you ask me. So you yeah. can do that regardless of what the end database is that uh, the docketing is going to eventually be entered into, correct? Yeah. Correct. Cool. How long does it take to get an AI docketing system up and running? For example, if you move from a vendor that does manual docketing to one that uses AI, what would be a typical startup time for that? Hmm. That's a really good question. Actually, let me, you know, Melena, let me jump in and answer that one. I okay. would say that, um, you know, that's really going to vary on the system, but assuming that um, the in system has good procedures that are already in place, and it's a matter of just creating the um, rules on our side with somebody like, um, with somebody like, um, uh, Melena and the rest of Melena's team and Leone, then, you know, typically in, I'd say about four to six weeks, maybe, assuming everything runs according to plan and we have both teams on both sides able to work together and uh, get the information that they need and um, everybody's all on board. Would you guys say that's fair? I would agree with that. Absolutely. Okay, good. Um, Okay, so this is another clarification on those document codings. So we talked about the example of PTO documents being coded final versus non-final, and this person is clarifying that it's more than just t things being miscoded in terms of it's an office action and it's final or non-final, but what if it's completely miscoded? It's marked as, let's say, an SB08, and it's really an office action or something else where they're coded as completely different documents. Can you identify that correctly? Yes, we can. Um, the rules that we have set up, it, it limits um, auto to go crazy and just make up a procedure to push through the uh, customer system. So because there are conditional statements that auto has to choose from, um, it we have it so that if he's not sure, and I know I'm talking about Otto as if he's a person, um, <laughs> uh, if he's not sure, he's not going to automate it. And it comes back to us, the de development team, to figure out why it failed. Good. So there's a lot of checks in place. Absolutely. 
I think this next one is a follow-up on one that I answered. Almost all docketing systems now you read the USPTO document codes from the image file wrapper and trigger tests. So I think that's a follow-up to the earlier question of don't uh, other systems do this. And I think we've already hit on through several questions here the fact that the PTO document codes aren't always right though. And if the commercial systems that are out there have functionality that just triggers a task off only the PTO document code, that's not always going to be right. But the technology that Milena and Leone and Z have described is something that goes much deeper than that and can, through other means, identify content in the docu document to determine what it actually is beyond just looking at the document code. So it's far more sophisticated in terms of its ability to correctly identify the document, which is such a critical part of the process. Right. Okay, so the next question, you have automated the actual docketing, but when Black Hills reports the completed docketing, is that automated? Does Black Hills provide a received report daily. And if you guys want, I can jump in on this one. Go ahead, Ann. Okay, so we have implemented uh, processes like that in different ways for different customers. And certainly one thing that we do with some of our uh, larger law firm clients right now is have an, automatically, an automatic report that's generated out of our internal system that runs every night that has a list of everything that we have in process that we have received that, that hasn't been docketed yet. So that's one way that we can do it. Another way that we've done it for people with a slightly different need uh, is to have a daily report that's generated out of our system that summarizes all the items where docketing has been complete, uh, has been completed. So many times that triggers processes within an organization once the docketing is completed in their system and they like that in a batch report. So, you know, Melena, I think you had mentioned the fact that in our systems we have many layers and we can use these layers of data and technology for more than just the actual determination of what to docket. And one of the things that we can do is we can use that data that we have to generate and provide um, status reports, for example. And, you know, we'd have to get into the specific thing that an individual customer wanted to determine if we could provide that. But if we have the data and it's something that we can generate as a regular scheduled report out of, a, you know, and have a template set up, oftentimes we can provide things like, like that. Okay, you gave an example of a Chinese office action in the beginning of your program. Are you planning on having auto docket foreign office actions? Oh, I'd like to answer yes. this one. <laughs> yes. Go ahead, Leonie. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, and specifically, I, I we are going to start with China and the EP. Um, but yes, we are. So and we're all very the, excited uh, about development. It, <laughs> the development roadmap. <laughs> it's not in production right now, but it's on the development roadmap, right? You guys are, you guys are like a new challenge, and uh, yes. those are those are challenging. Yep. And I know from what I've seen, from what your team has done so far, um, <laughs> you're not going to do anything unless you know you can do it right. So you're That's taking right. on the challenge, and if you can determine how to do this, uh, then that's something that will will be in future. Uh, uh, iterations of our um, automated services. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, this is a great one. As a part of the automated docketing task, can AI also de-docket, and this is very specific, any due diligence activities that might be open in the matter record? So that's a very specific question, but let, let's let's generalize that a little bit. If you're docketing something, as part of that docketing process, can you also complete a deadline in addition to just the standard what we've been talking about, which would be adding a deadline? Yes, Auto has the ability to um, not only add deadlines, but close um, outdated deadlines and even add, you know, most 
customers will ask for this, a status check. Great. All right, we, um, I'm going to take two more questions here. We're a little bit over our time, but we're still getting some really good questions, and I've got two more. Um, I like this one. What happens with auto if auto receives a document that it has never seen before? Let's say a new USPTO document. What happens then? I really like this question. Um, Malena or Z had mentioned before how we truly do rely on experienced doctors. Um, though our automation team is small, we have a huge um, backing to uh, what we know and what we're feeding auto, and that is our docketing uh, department. And they have given us many, many um, different types of documents that auto or I have never seen before. So they provide us with a lot of that type of information. Um, but overall, we've, I would say we've built a pretty good library, especially in the last three years, as to what to anticipate in, um, in the different countries that we're automating. Especially, and let me jump. yes. Sorry, Leonie. Oh no, it's okay. Let me just add to that because I think maybe the if the question was like literally, let's say the patent office just comes up with a brand new document that no one's ever seen, what would Auto do in that situation? And the answer is we have we have rules set in place that if Auto fails for whatever reason, and Leonie mentioned this earlier, that goes to a human being to look at. So if if truly this was a document that has never showed up anywhere and this was the first time anyone's ever seen it that would go to a person to determine what to do with it right and i'm glad you clarified that melena because um i think said simply auto will never guess right that's right auto, <laughs> exactly. auto is not a gambler auto no. doesn't take chances <laughs> auto then, only dockets something when auto knows with 100 percent certainty what yes. it is that's, That's right. exactly right. And that is exactly kind of circling back to my AI tutorial. That is exactly why we are living in the rules engine part of the quadrant and not the machine learning, because the machine learning would allow auto to guess to some mm -hmm. extent. Yeah, that that that's that's a great connection back to that, and I'm really glad you set that stage at the beginning, uh, Melina, because that is right. We have um, there are specific questions and specific answers, right? And exactly. it only works, it will only be applied when there is a known answer to a known question. All right, so one more. Is it currently only USPTO that auto mails? How can Canadian uh, mail, for example, be handled? I'm trying to figure that out. <laughs> well, how about here? I can, I can jump in on that because I think I know where this is going. Um, there's another aspect to our technology that automatically um, downloads the docketing from the USPTO and at, at present we can only automatically download correspondence from the USPTO and not from the Canadian Patent Office or other patent offices, although that's probably on the technology roadmap too. But with respect to office actions from other countries and in particular fairly standardized ones like Canada or the EPO, for example, those can still be processed through our rules engine, correct, Leonie yeah. and Melena? Yes, because we have the ability, uh, definitely when we're confident with what we're looking at, uh, we have the ability to standardize it so that um, our system and our rules can digest it without devaluing what we're actually docketing. So yeah, it's just a question of how that gets to us, right? And it would have to be uh, sent to us by email, for example. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And I'm sorry, Melina, you started to add to Leonie's comment. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add that even, even if it's a document that we may have not fully automated, all of the documents we process today benefit from that machine-guided technology that was referred to earlier in the presentation. Yeah. Yeah, and I understand that that may, you know, individual circumstances may vary if that is a document that uh, individual is still receiving in paper. Obviously, they would have to scan and um, forward that to us by email, although most organizations 
have moved towards a more paperless model where they typically do have communications like that coming in from their outside counsel or somebody else in an electronic format, and then they can provide it to us uh, simply by email so that we can process it with our technology. All right, we've gone quite a bit past our normal time. I appreciate everybody who hung on and listened, and I appreciate the great questions that we've got today. And I um, want to thank our speakers. Thank you so much, um, Melena and Z and Leone, for your time today. Before everybody goes, I just want to let people know who might not be familiar with our other webinars that we do webinars for free in a number of different areas. We have an operations excellence webinar series that uh, has a program, I believe, next week talking about the U.S. paralegal procedures associated with the um, uh, foreign filing process. We And there are several other operations uh, webinars in that series that are recorded on our website that you can go and listen to. We have an international excellence series that is a little bit more oriented towards attorneys and focuses on an in-depth look at the patent process in different countries. I believe um, next week as well, we have a program on patenting in Singapore as part of that series. And then the series that started all of this that's been ongoing is the Docketing Excellence series. And that program, that webinar series is in the middle of a number of webinars uh, related to various aspects of trademark docketing. You can find out about any of those webinar series, both the upcoming ones and then also find audio recordings and slides from previous ones on the Black Hills IP website under the menu for our educational resources. So I want to thank our audience for participating today. I hope you'll join us for some of these other webinars in the future and maybe even listen to some of the past ones that you haven't uh, taken in. So thank you very much. Uh, have a great day.